So within the last few hours, we've had some new information, some possible new information released by News Nation concerning the Idaho murders. This revolves around the timeline of events and the possibility that Ethan Chapin was killed in the doorway of Zaina Canodal's bedroom. So I'm going to run through quickly what has been stated here, and then I'm going to talk to you about what I believe may have happened during the evening or early morning hours of November the 13th. So basically what they're saying here is that the perpetrator entered the property, the two girls on the third floor were killed first, the perpetrator then made his way back down the stairs where he possibly encountered Ethan Chapin at the entrance to Zaina Canodal's bedroom. Ethan received a cut to the neck and then Zaina Canodal was the last person to be attacked. Now to me, this does make quite a lot of logical sense. If the killer approaches from the back of the property, he comes into that property, makes his way up to the third floor. I believe he's opened the door where Murphy resides, the dog. He opens the door, disturbs the dog. We then have uh, either Kaylee or Madison say there's someone here, which is heard by the surviving roommate Dylan Mortensen. The suspect or the perpetrator realises his mistake at this point in time. The only thing that's actually in that bedroom is Murphy the dog and an empty bed. He then makes his way into the other bedroom, which is occupied at that point in time by Kaylee and Madison. I would imagine a struggle ensues, which is heard by Ethan downstairs. He gets out of bed. He makes his way to the doorway of Zayna's bedroom, where he encounters the perpetrator who has walked down the stairs and there's a face-to-face -face confrontation between the suspect and Ethan Chapin. He is attacked, Zayna is attacked, and then the perpetrator makes his escape. That's how I picture it in my own mind. But we need to remember that the coroner had a very different version of events concerning these murders. She claimed that not one of these victims had any slash wounds, they were all stab wounds, and they were all found in their beds. Let's quickly take a look at a very small section of the affidavit here, which I believe could shed some light on what has taken place here and how it could potentially relate to this new information. Officer Smith and I entered the King Road residence through the bottom floor door on the north side of the building. Officer Smith and I then walked upstairs to the second floor. Officer Smith directed me down the hallway to the west bedroom on the second floor, which I later learned through Zayna's driving licence and other personal belongings found in the room was Zayna Canodal's bedroom. Just before this room, there was a bathroom door on the south wall of the hallway. As I approached the room, I could see a body, later identified as Canodal's, laying on the floor. Canodal was deceased with wounds which appeared to have been caused by an edged weapon. Also in the room was a male, later identified as Ethan Chapin. He was deceased with wounds later determined to be caused by a sharp force injuries. I then followed Officer Smith upstairs to the third floor of the residence. The third floor consisted of two bedrooms and one bathroom. The bedroom on the west side of the floor was later determined to be Kaylee Gonsalves' room. There was a dog in the room when Moscow police officers initially responded. The dog belonged to Gonsalves and her ex-boyfriend Jack Decour. I found out from my interview with Jack on November the 13th, 2022, that he and Gonsalves shared the dog. Officer Smith then pointed out a small bathroom on the east side of the third floor. This bathroom shared a wall with Madison Mogan's bedroom. As I entered this bedroom, I could see two females in the single bed in the room. Both Gonsalves and Mogan were deceased with visible stab wounds. I also later noticed what appeared to be a tan leather knife sheath laying on the bed next to Mogan's right side. Now, a lot of these news stations seem to really get hung up on brief conversations with people who are connected to the case, i.e. the coroner. Well, the coroner said that they were stabbed, they were found in their bed. It's like people hang on to these little words as if it's like the gospel truth or something, you know. It's, it's really weird. Basically, they're just giving you an overview of what they've seen. They're not going to say, well, 
yes, okay, yeah, well, we, I walked into the uh, the property, and uh, Ethan had two slash wounds, four stab wounds, Kaylee had two slash wounds, a slash wound here, a sta you know, it doesn't work like that. You know, these news media companies, corporations, whatever, um, in America that, that are seeking this information, as I say, they're almost taking it as the gospel truth. This is a coroner who probably doesn't even really want to be on your show talking about what they've discovered in this awful, horrible crime. They're not going to be giving you minute details as to what that crime scene looked like. And I think they're trying to hang on to this in some way and trying to, I don't know, basically say that what the coroner is saying doesn't match up with this new information. But what I want to go by is the affidavit. And rereading that here, there doesn't appear to be any real consistency in these individuals' wounds. It's not like we have the officers walking in and on each occasion they've described the, this individual was, was killed by a sharp-edged weapon. We're not seeing that here. We're not seeing that through uh, the two girls that were found on the third floor and Zayna and Ethan on the second floor. There's a different description almost for each individual. And I mean, really, all you need to do is look at the affidavit and make up your own mind, whether you believe that this was a you know a cold-blooded killer who knew exactly what he was doing, knew exactly where to injure these individuals. Everyone was was injured with a certain amount of stab wounds. It's very calculated, very cold. Or was this someone who was in a complete frantic state, which is what I personally believe, which we'll get onto just in a little while. But when you look, as I say, at the affidavit, this is really all you need to know. All of these individuals are described as not being killed in a different way as such, but there's no consistency here. Zayna Canodal had wounds which were consistent um, of what, by being caused by an edged weapon. Then we have Ethan Chapin in the same room as Zayna Canodal, who is described as having injuries caused by sharp force trauma or sharp force injuries. And then you have the two girls on the top floor. And they are described as having visible stab wounds. So there's no consistency there. There's not one, uh, one piece of terminology used to describe all of these individuals' wounds, if that makes sense. Which could tell us that they have different types of wounds. Slashes, stabs, whatever. But interestingly there, it does mention that Ethan Chapin was found in the room. Not outside the room, not in the hallway, not in the doorway, but in the room of Zayna Canodal, Zayna Canodal's bedroom. Let's just reread that very small section there. Also in the room was a male later identified as Ethan Chapin. So a lot of people are going to jump on this and say, well, we can't be in the hallway and then be found in the bedroom. I mean, that's not possible. But then think about it logically. It's, it's highly unlikely that he's going to be attacked and stay completely stationary. He's most likely in the doorway or just coming out of Zayna Canodal's bedroom when he encounters the suspect. Maybe he stumbles back into that bedroom. Maybe he tries to protect Zayna, which is probably the most likely scenario here. But he, uh, however this has happened, he has ended up or, you know, been found back in the bedroom of Zayna Canodal. And to me, that does make sense. He's very unlikely to be struck and fall dead where he has been attacked. He's right by the bedroom door, probably just coming out of that bedroom when this attack starts. So in summary, I do believe that this is quite possible here, that Ethan Chapin may have been attacked in the doorway or just coming out into the hallway of that property when he came face to face with the killer. I think a lot of people get fixated or stuck on this idea that this was an individual who was trying to commit the perfect murder. This was someone who was waiting in the shadows, approaching the house stealthily, almost like a ninja. But that's not the impression I get when looking at what has taken place here. We have an individual, if this is Brian Koberger, who has approached that property not knowing what he's going to expect inside. He approaches the property when they're already inside. He hasn't been outside staking that house for hours on end, knowing exactly who's inside there. He's got no idea. Something has, has uh, tipped this individual over the edge at some point in time. Either he's fantasy or whatever has become too much and he needs to act now but there's massive mistakes it's almost frantic very out of control both before these murders during the murders and also after the event 
And I think that's partly demonstrated by the fact that when this individual enters the property initially, he opens the wrong bedroom door. He opens the door with the dog inside, with Murphy inside, and an empty bed. He doesn't really know what he's doing. He knows why he's there. He knows what his purpose is, but there's no real proper planning which has taken place in order to commit this crime in the cleanest, fastest way possible. Yes, this was done in a very quick manner, but it's all frantic. It's completely out of control. Also demonstrated by the fact that this individual drives, you know, past the house on three or four occasions, needs to do a three-point turn because he's probably missed the turning that he needs to go up in order to park the car and get out and commit these crimes. It's very, very sloppy, very, very messy, and as I've said a million times, very, very frantic. Not just in the pre-planning, not just in uh, the events which transpired leading up to the attack, but also the attack itself. The fact that he has gone into the wrong bedroom, then most likely murdered the, t the uh, two girls on the third floor, come down the stairs and been approached or has caught the eye of a male individual who probably didn't even know was in the house at the time because of his terrible planning. He's had to attack this individual and also Zayna. And then he may have even seen a surviving roommate in Dylan Mortensen, but still exited the property and also left the knife sheath on the bed upstairs. It's a complete and total loss of control here. Anyway, do let me know what you think about these recent developments and this recent information which has just come out. Do leave your own thoughts and theories in the comments section below. Please do give this video a thumbs up and click the subscribe button below to be notified of future content. I look forward to seeing you all again for the next one. Take care. Cheers.